It's Mother's Day, 1984, and two teenagers are playing in a field near their home in Southeast Tampa. We were playing out there with homemade parachutes, and they noticed an odor. And at first they thought it was like a dead cow or something like that, which would not be all that uncommon in that rural area. And they discovered a body. They called the sheriff's office and then homicide detectives from the sheriff's office responded out there. We find a young woman's body laying face down in the dirt. The body had been placed in a position of wanting to display the body almost. Her legs had been spread apart, dislocating her hips, and her hands were tied behind her back. She had a rope around her neck that was looped a couple of times around. Detectives see that the rope is in a slip knot, an easily adjusted knot that looks like a hangman's noose and can be loosened or tightened at will. The rope around the neck was almost placed there more like a controlling device. It was like a dog leash around the victim's neck. Just two weeks later, about 28 miles away, a man discovers a horrifying scene and notifies police. There is another female dumped on the side of the road. It's a secluded area, and it was a, a dirt road area. This victim was a fresh victim, so to speak. She uh, had not started any deterioration, and it was obvious that she had been dumped a very short time prior to being discovered. She was nude. She was positioned on her back. Her clothing was strewn around the body. Her hands were tied behind her back. It, it was one of the most uh, horrible scenes that I had seen. Her throat was slashed. One thing that gets our attention is that there's been a rope tied around her neck like a leash to control her. We looked more closely at the ligatures at that point in time and determined that uh, there were similarities there between that and the Lana Long homicide. The ligatures, the ropes, all seemed to connect to the previous investigation. An autopsy reveals that this victim was also beaten, stabbed, raped, and strangled. Along with the ligatures, we found trilobal lustrous red carpet fibers at the second scene. The fiber was found on several parts of her body, one near the uh, left breast, some in the hair, and we also found some on her clothing. We sent the evidence off to the FBI lab to see if we can connect anything together. The FBI lab told us we got the same trilobal fibers as at the original crime scene. The red carpet fiber is not just similar, it is from the same vehicle. We know that we have two cases that are connected because of the leash type rope and the red carpet fibers. After that second homicide, we knew we had a serial killer. The mark of this killer is the use of bindings and ropes and leash-like objects as ligatures for strangulation. What we see in this mark is the use of an external object to control and humiliate and treat almost like a dog. This individual is a sexual sadist. He gets pleasure not so much from the killing, but from the torture, the crying, the screaming, the pain. 
That adding of a leash is something that wasn't typical. This gave him the ability to yank them one way. He can loosen, he can tighten. He can repeat that over and over for as long as he wants. If you have a leash around someone's neck and you pull, that person can do nothing. He wants to experience their helplessness and then keeping that ligature very tight so that they're struggling. It isn't just, can I stop her from breathing or talking or this or that? It's, I'm gonna restrict movement or I'm gonna force movement in the way that I want. And actually forcing movement sometimes might be even scarier and more painful than restricting movement. This was something he had honed as very much his mark. There's a lot of anger, possibly even hatred toward these, these women who probably just simply represent to him females. He's a hostile, angry guy who's, who's gonna continue to kill. My teenage years were unbearable. I did not have a good childhood. I was always down, depressed, sad. My mother was hard up for money and we didn't have a lot. We lived on the streets, we were homeless. And what kind of childhood is that? When I was 14, my grandmother got this great idea of me moving in with her and her boyfriend. Started working at Krispy Kreme Donut Shop. We rode my bicycle every day. And then one day, my grandmother came to me and said her boyfriend was interested in me and he was going to teach me how to please a man. I was 14 years old, did not know and understand what she was talking about. And for the next three years, he brutally attacked and raped me with her knowledge. The night before my abduction, which was November 3rd, early hours in the morning, I came to terms of being done with my life. I felt disgusting, I felt betrayed, I felt like a nobody. I was so tired of living, so tired of being hurt, I didn't know a way out. Who can I tell? I had no one to trust to tell what was going on at home. So um, I sat down, I wrote my suicide note, and I said I didn't want to live anymore and this is why, and I just can't take it anymore. I was at the moment of my life of just feeling as, I just want to be free, to where no one would ever, ever be able to hurt me again. I got off at work at two o'clock in the morning, pedaling my bicycle home, and I remember being happy, because I knew I was gonna go home, just end it all. And as I'm riding my bicycle, some guy just jumped out and grabbed me from behind my neck and dragged me off my bike. And from that moment, something just clicked. Yes, I was gonna go home and kill myself, but now I'm in a position, I felt like I was forced to fight for my life. It's like God was saying, not my watch, you're not gonna kill yourself. This is what we're gonna go through together. Bobby DeLong gave me the gift of empowerment to, to survive. I mean, yes, I was gonna kill myself, but then, then this. It just got to the point, I'm done. I'm gonna stand up strong and take no more. Victim's not in my vocabulary. If anything, that horrible tragedy got me out of my home life. If anything, what he did to me empowered me, made me stronger. It gave me my life back. I am a Hillsborough County Sheriff uh, Master Deputy. I've been um, in the Sheriff's Office working 20 years. Life is what you make of it. Either you lay down and take the beating and let it defeat you, or get up, brush the dust off your britches, and go on. My name is Cindy Brown, and I am the former wife of Bobby Joe Long, who is a serial killer. You know, I think what attracted me to him so much was he was tall, he had gorgeous eyes, gorgeous hair, and his personality. He was always funny, cracking jokes, kind of a smart aleck, but, you know, that was intriguing, you know, because I was a bit of a smart aleck myself, too, so. We ended up getting married in January of 75. He was my first everything, and 
we were going to finally live this happy life together. And now we had this little baby on its way. So this was, you know, match made in heaven. And here we were, you know, our fairy tale story. We'd met when we were young and now we're grown up and we have a child and everything was going great. We had bought a little house and then, you know, March 14th rolls around and he has his motorcycle accident. And it was just like, things just started changing so much after that motorcycle accident. I mean, you know, the nasty name calling, the chokings, the beatings, and the doctor kept saying, it's from the head injury, it'll get better. As the brain heals, it'll change. It really never got any better. It just progressively got worse. This one night, I came home from work. An argument developed and everything, and the next thing I knew, I was on the couch, I had blood pouring down my forehead, and you know, he was like, you need to go to the hospital, I'm so sorry, you know, why do you push me to this point if you would just shut your smart mouth? I had like the perfect bruising on my throat already from where he had choked me and then slammed me into the TV. So the police officer told me, he says, you know, we're gonna go arrest him. And I begged, I mean, I begged with all my might, please don't. He told me he would kill me, he's got my kids. So then the cop said, okay, I'll give you a week and I'm gonna come by your house and if you haven't filed for divorce, he says, then I will arrest him at that point. He says, cause I'm telling you, if he's doing this kind of damage to you, you know, he says, he's gonna kill you and he may end up killing you and your children. I went to work and when I walked into work, our attorney looked at me and she said, my God, he's done it to you again. And I said, yeah, and I need your help. So my friend Rochelle, the attorney, she prepared the divorce papers and I took them home that night. And I said, Bob, I'm filing for divorce. And we filed for my divorce on June 29th and we were divorced July the 1st.